Well, good evening. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, I, as usual, as we start singing, I think uh, some of the seats will begin to fill up. It's almost like the Pied Piper. People hear the music and they just start coming. And it's, it's a neat little effect that I love. Uh, we're singing about faith tonight uh, from two different angles, either the faith that we have as believers or God's faithfulness towards us. So as we sing tonight, just keep faith in mind as each song is pointing towards that. He's got the whole world in his hands. We hear all this nonsense in, in the world today, but God is still in control and he's got the whole world in his hands. Go ahead and stand and we'll sing this old, old chorus together. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got the wind and the rain in his hands. He's got the wind and the rain in his hands. He's got the wind. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. He's got the helpless little baby in his hands. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got the whole world 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 in his hands. He's got the whole world. And when we have faith, we've already got a victory. Faith is the victory as we continue to sing here tonight. Faith is the victory. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over his love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame. We'll vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory. And this, another, another little chorus, this short little chorus out of the hymnal. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Um, God can do the impossible. Let's sing this. This is short enough. We're going to sing this two times through. Got any rivers? Got 
Good evening and welcome, and you may be seated all at the same time. We're glad you're with us tonight, chosen to come back and worship with us this evening. So I'm looking around for first-time visitors, and I'm not seeing any, but you're eligible if you scratch your head, Brother Wayne. As Brother Jerry this morning caught some people waving at one another, so they were first-time visitors this morning. So Brother Wayne's back there. There's a lady itching her chin right there. There's another visitor. That's the way it works when we get desperate, amen? But we're glad you're with us tonight. Let me make a couple of announcements for you. Mrs. Weatherholt will be in the lobby after the evening service to continue selling tickets for the Aladdin program here on Thursday night and Friday night at 7 o'clock, uh, put on by our Ruskin Christian School Drama Department. And I'm sure you will have a good night of fun, clean entertainment if you decide to come and bring your family to that and then see how our kids have performed and worked for several weeks to get ready for these two performances. It's kind of different, you know, from playing a baseball team or something like that. You play all season and here you have to work all season just for two performances. And um, so it's a lot of work for just a two-night performance and when it's over, it's like, wow, it's over. What else are we going to do now? But a lot of work goes into this, and we appreciate all of our kids and uh, Mrs. Talley, who's worked with our kids for several weeks now to get us ready. Brother Robert's been, I think, at every practice uh, that they've had working with the music, so we appreciate that. Brother Jim was here yesterday working with the sound, as we had a walk through yesterday as well. So just a lot of work goes into it. A lot of people participate. So Wednesday night, when you come to church, things look a little bit different up here. You'll be in the land of Aladdin. On Wednesday night, because they'll put up the stage and everything tomorrow. Also, we have a prayer request asked by uh, the Hagers to pray for their grandson, Skyler, as he goes to an orthopedic surgeon tomorrow to follow up on an appointment about a healing of his arm. They said if it's not healing properly, he will have to undergo surgery. So they've asked us to pray for Skyler Hager. The doctor's appointment is tomorrow. And so pray for him. Also, continue to pray for Glenn Armstrong and the Viers family and Miss Wilma's passing, and they would appreciate your prayers. Well, after we have an opening word of prayer, the choir is going to sing, He's Always Been Faithful, shall we pray. Father God, again, thank you for your blessings upon this day. Thank you for bringing us together safely tonight. We do pray for Glenn, give him strength, be with Shelly's sons, uh, Tony and Roger, give them the same strength that's needed through these very difficult days. We just pray for others, uh, the Denver Moore family down in Parrish and his passing a couple weeks ago. We pray for Laura and her family as well. And Lord, we just pray that you'll just, as the Bible says, be a friend closer than a brother. We just pray that their needs will be met, their emotional, physical, and financial and spiritual needs. We pray for Skylar tomorrow with his doctor's appointment. We would pray that uh, this arm is healing properly, maybe even better than the doctors would expect so they can give you the honor and the glory and the praise. And so we look to hear good things about that. Be the choir now as they sing in Christ's name. Amen.
Just uh, just one more quick note uh, about the Aladdin performance. Uh, our director, Miss Tally, is always good at, at maximizing her resources and, and putting students in exactly the right place for success. But every once in a while, uh, there's there's some holes that need to be filled, and this year was no exception. So uh, she's had to bring in some uh, some ringers. There's a couple of uh, uh, Broadway type people that you're gonna see in the in the show on Thursday and Friday night. And that's all, that's all I'm gonna say. What part are you playing? It's not me. I was in Singing in the Rain last year, but I'm gonna be back there with, uh, with the music cues and the lighting cues. Uh, but there are, there's some world famous people that are gonna be. You'll just have to come and see for yourself and keep a sharp eye out for some, some non-student talent that will be in there 
uh, this coming weekend. Well, the choir is going to come down into the congregation, and we're going to keep singing about faith. Faith of our fathers. Let's go ahead and stand, and we'll keep singing tonight. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon fire and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whene'er we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true. chained in prisons dark were still in heart and conscience free how sweet would be their children's fate if they like them could die for thee faith of our fathers hold fathers we will love both friend and foe in all our strife and preach thee to as love knows how by kindly words and virtuous life faith of our fathers hold Another great hymn out of the hymnal, Trust in Jesus. We put our faith and trust in Jesus. One more song together tonight. Trust in Jesus. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy Trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly. Trusting as the days go by. Trusting Him, whatever befall. Trusting Jesus, that is all. All brightly does his spirit shine into this poor heart of mine. While he leads, I cannot fall, trusting Jesus. That is all. Trusting as the fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting him whate'er befall, trusting Jesus that is all, singing if my way is clear, pray Jesus, that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him, whate'er befall, 
trusting Jesus, that is all. Thanks so much for singing together tonight. Go ahead and have a seat. And as you settle in, you can listen as Jim Farr brings our vocal special tonight. See little David facing Goliath out on the battlefield with just a sling. Down in his heart were songs of deliverance. And as he reached for a stone, you could hear him sing. My God is able, my God is faithful. He will deliver, I have no doubt. I would not be here without believing. My God is faithful and able, and he will deliver me out. The Hebrew boys were tossed in the furnace. They lost their freedom, but not their song. They sang with heavenly three-part harmony. That's when God came down and joined their victory song. My God is able, my God is faithful, he will deliver, I have no doubt. I would not be here without believing, my God is able and faithful and he will deliver me out. I faced my own giants and I felt the furnace flame. And I've had my share of problems this life has bring. But I've never seen a problem that God didn't have a plan. And with that great assurance, I can stand and I can sing. My God is able. My God is faithful. He will deliver. I have no doubt. I would not be here without believing. My God is able and faithful and he will deliver me out. My God is able, my God is faithful. He will deliver, I have no doubt. I would not be here without believing. My God is able and faithful, and he will deliver me out. My God is able and faithful, and he will deliver me out. Jim, if it makes you feel any better, I, I one time sang a song. This is back in Illinois, and a fellow left the church that night and said, he used to like that song. <laughs> he thought I butchered it so bad it was, <laughs> I, I thought it did okay. <laughs> We've got a couple folks to pray for. Uh, the Widden's grandson, Eli, still at All Children's Hospital. Uh, they did blood work on him and did some other tests, and they are keeping him for observation. We need help in the security ministry. Uh, through the COVID thing, we've lost a couple folks, and now we're starting to pick up, and things are getting a little busier, and uh, the fellows who are working that ministry are working very consistent, but it'd be good to have a couple others when it just, it'd be helpful. So if you pray about helping in that security ministry, if you are interested in it, uh, let me know. Let one of the staff members know. Uh, call the church office. We'll get you a hold of you with uh, Lee Davis, and put you to work. Sometimes the work is just as simple as unlocking a door, saying hello to folk. Uh, we can, we'll use you to the extent that you'd like to be used. Romans chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 12 through verse 18 tonight. We're looking at the doctrine of sanctification. 
The idea is that sanctification is expected by God of everyone who has accepted the gift of salvation. In salvation, according to Romans chapter 6, 1 through 11, we are delivered from the domain of death. And then right now, from verse 12 through verse 23, we are delivered from the domain of sin. This morning we saw where sin was defeated in verse 12, 13, and 14. Let's go ahead and read that for the sake of context. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. This evening, we're going to look at some practical aspects of the doctrine of sanctification. We're going to look at three things. We'll look at liberty in Christ, and that'll be our study tonight. We'll come back next Sunday and look at loyalty to Christ and longevity to Christ. But tonight, we have a new liberty in Christ. The second half of Romans chapter 6 begins with a similar argument and a same answer as we began in Romans chapter 1. Let's read Romans 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And now in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? God forbid. So why the repetition? Why address such a similar issue with the same answer? There are two possibilities. I can answer them with questions. Number one, is it habitual sin that's being addressed? We looked at that this morning. The habitual sin is not to be participated in. Or maybe it's an occasional sin that's being addressed. I can't tell you for certain. In my studies of it, I, I, I just... I did not, I could not get past to find out exactly what it was. So for this audience, we're going to assume that none of us are involved in habitual sin. That safe assumption? You're doing your best to live for the Lord. You, you, just, you, you don't have sinful habits. You've, you've worked them out of your life. So you're, you're striving to do your best to serve him. But what all of us struggle with is occasional sin. So, you're on a road trip and you've been driving all day. Long distance, exemplary driving. You have not been speeding. You've not run one red light. Why, you even used your car blinkers. When you were going to turn, matter of fact, you were so good on this trip that you used your car blinkers to change lanes. But that's legal. You can do that. It's actually a good idea. But near the end of the day, since you missed your nap, you're a little bit tired. And before too long, you get jarred out of your stupor by some blue lights behind you. And he's pulled in close to you. And as you look in your mirror, you see him go. And you pull over. Turns out you were tired and you crossed the lane marker and did it just enough times that he's now concerned about you. So now you're in trouble, not for habitual bad driving, but for an occasional minor problem. And everybody who drives by you knows you're a sinner. Years ago when our kids were in school, one of our church members was pulled over by the police at the entrance to the school. Everybody knew who Tracy was, and we all drove by Tracy, and she's doing this. And she couldn't hide because she's the only woman in town that had that particular car in that particular color. It was real obvious. She came to church on Wednesday night and said, I don't want to hear it. I said, you're a sinner. And that man proved you're a sinner. 
I don't know what she did. Back to you. Shouldn't you get some credit for driving so good all day long? You've done a good job all day, and all that guy wants to do is pick apart your driving. He did one little thing wrong, and he goes drawing attention to it. Is it unfair for police to expect perfection? Matter of fact, anytime you get pulled over by the cop, you should tell him about the policeman that you saw speeding without his lights on. You should remind him that they are all sinners too, and they drive bad too. You should tell him all about it. Probably not. Is it unfair for the police to expect perfection in driving? Is it unfair for God to expect us to avoid sin? Is it unfair for God to expect perfection in living? Just as drivers are forbidden to violate the standards known as traffic laws, we, believers, are not to violate the standards known as moral laws. When the policeman pulled you over, no one who passed you could know or suspect that you've been driving perfectly all day long. No one will know or appreciate all the good things that you did earlier in the day. All that will be known is what's taking place at that moment. And everyone will assume that you, the driver, are a lawbreaker. You're a sinner behind the wheel. And it's embarrassing. And that, my friends, is the problem with occasionally sinning. When you sin, even occasionally, everyone who knows about it, that will assume that sin employed is sin enjoyed, and sin enjoyed is typically habitual. Sin that is known ruins a reputation and a testimony. Now, I'm going to explain the difference between a reputation and a testimony because, honestly, in church, in our day, most folks use the terms interchangeably, and they're not the same. Reputation is what you are known, what is believed about you by others. If someone says, what about that person? It's your reputation that will be spoken. Testimony is what you say. It's what you speak. In a courtroom, someone might be called to give an eyewitness testimony. Their reputation doesn't matter. Someone might be called as an expert witness their reputation matters a lot. Or there might be a jail snitch who comes in and gives testimony in spite of their reputation, and their testimony should not mean much. After all, look where they got them from. Your testimony is a product of your reputation. Your reputation can destroy your testimony. If you have no reputation, your testimony might be interesting, could be ignored. If you have a good reputation, your testimony will be respected. And if you have a poor testimony, your poor reputation, sorry, your testimony will be hindered and may not be helpful at all. An eyewitness testimony doesn't have to be an expert, but in a court of law, an eyewitness testimony is even more powerful than an expert testimony because an expert is giving his opinion. An eyewitness is saying, this is what I saw. This is what I heard. That is powerful stuff. That jailhouse snitch testimony typically is given in exchange for a reduced sentence, and I think it should be believed about that much. I, I, I don't think it should be trusted at all. Matter of fact, I don't think police should use jailhouse snitches. I, I, just, I, think, it's, I think it's shady. And I don't like it when the police are shady. I, I, I want them to be the most upright people of all. I want to respect them greatly. So, the believer's job is to serve the Savior and not to sin. If you, if you sin and the sin becomes known, your reputation will be hindered. And your reputation ought to be used in order to enhance your testimony. Learn more about this whole concept in verse 16 through 18. Let's read all three of them. No, you're not. That to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. 
So we begin in verse 16. We'll call it sin's logic in service. In the concept of the culture to which the New Testament epistles were written, Roman Empire, first century culture, people were either free, meaning they were citizens, or they were slaves. What we call slavery, the Bible often calls servanthood. In the Roman Empire, there are some estimates that during some period of time, during that three or 400 years that the empire reigned, that there was sometimes twice as many people who were slaves than as people who were citizens. So they understood the principles of slavery better than we do because they lived it, and they lived around it. What we understand about slavery is from a foreign culture or from American culture about a century and a half ago or more, maybe two centuries ago. It's all unpleasant, and it's very ugly, but none of us really know what slavery is. Except slavery to sin, and that we know. Paul takes this fact of life, and he makes a practical application to the situation concerning sanctification. If you're a servant to sin, you're not free. That's what he said here in verse 16. If sin has control of your life, if sin is reigning your life, then you are not free. If sin is your habit, even if occasional sin is your way to relieve stress, you're a servant of sin. You're a slave. Typically, slaves don't get to choose their master, but we get to. In the biblical concept and biblical principle of slavery, we can choose to serve sin by yielding to temptation, which in the end brings death, or we can choose to serve Christ by being obedient to him, which produces righteousness. Verse 16 again, know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Our choice. I don't have to serve anybody or anything that I don't choose to. So, I am a servant of sin, or I'm a servant of Christ. But since I have been set free, I can choose, easily choose, to serve the Savior. It's a choice that a lost man doesn't have. I've been forgiven of my sin. I've been set free. If the Son, though, first shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, as with freedom, I can make choices. If someone is a slave, they cannot make choices. Choices are made for them. So I have liberty. I have freedom. I can choose. You can too. Whose slave are you? You're either a slave of the Savior in thought, word, and deed, or a slave to sin, in thought, word, and deed. Now, for anyone who might be thinking, I don't like being called a slave. That's offensive. You'll have to take it up with the author of the book. Now, since Paul's not around, you can register your complaint with the Holy Spirit. He's the one who inspired the Apostle Paul to write it. These words are offensive. By the way, In our culture today, being offensive is wonder, or being offended, I should say, being offended is wonderful. I mean, if you just announce that you're offended, you can take over, you can be in charge. I'm offended. I was offended this week. Uh, Tuesday night, I was really offended by my president. By the way, he is my president. And he offended me as good as any president I've ever had has ever offended me. I don't remember a president ever offending me as he offended me on Tuesday night. Now, I've forgiven him. I've prayed for him. I'd love to speak with him someday. He called our country systemically racist. Our president right now has spent four decades in Washington, D.C., in the highest offices of this land. He's been a national representative. He's been a senator. 
He spent eight years as the vice president, and now he's the president. If this country is systematically racist, he is at fault, and he is to blame. There is no one in, our, in America, not one person in America, who's held as many high offices for as long as he has. And then he says that about the country that I love. And I'm, as you can tell, I have offended. And now I've gotta, I got to forgive him again. I mean, he's going to get close to the 7 times 70 stuff here if we keep it up. In my opinion, this man has done more harm to America in 100 days than any other president in my lifetime did in their whole term. Another thing I'm offended about, you hang on to your hat, I'm offended that anyone who names Jesus Christ as their Savior would vote for him. I don't understand you. I cannot imagine that before you voted for him, you prayed and asked God to guide you. I don't understand you. I had a conversation with a man whom I respect. There is no one in this world who I respect more than this man. My wife heard the conversation. He said, can't believe you voted for Trump. And I said, Jim, I can't believe you voted for Joe. He said, Trump speaks bad about women. He said, he does. He did. I was very uncomfortable with it. I said, Joe's been accused by a, man, by a woman named Tara Reid of rape. He said, where'd you learn that? I said, why didn't you learn it? I said, tell me about Joe's son. He said, what about Joe's son? I said, you read a newspaper every day, don't you? He said, yes. And I said, the newspaper that you read is worthless. Because they took sides and they hid the truth from you so you'd vote for that man. You, you don't know what he's been accused of. You don't know what he's done. I said, you know everything bad that Donald Trump did? Everything. And I said, you were deceived. It made him get a little upset with me. And I said, you're too old to be deceived. You're too mature to be deceived. You should know better. He didn't like being spanked, but. Now, here's what I'm going to say to me. Because I've said it before, and I'll say it now. The spiritually mature are not easily offended. Okay? It's really hard to offend the spiritually mature. An example of that is Jesus Christ. You, you look at the Gospels. Tell me where Jesus Christ was offended. Oh, once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end. Both times he went in the temple and he turned over the tables and he was offended because of what they were doing in God's house, defaming his father's name. But he never got offended at himself. For anything was done to him. He was always offending for something else. So... I promise you, I am going to continue to pray for my president because I want him to do better. I want him to be a good president. Verse 17 and 18, we're going to make a practical application of the principles of slavery and sermon to hopefully take away some of the offensiveness. And by the way, my, the person I was speaking to said, you, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't talk about politics in church. And I said, the problem with that is, if it's a moral issue and the church does not address it, then we don't understand what the moral issues are, and then believers will not understand morality. And the way you vote is becoming a moral issue. Remember that before we were saved, we were considered by God to be dead in trespasses and sin? Ephesians 2.1. Remember also in Romans 6, 11, earlier we were told that we were to reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In salvation, there is a transition from being dead in sin to being dead to sin. You were in it, and now you're dead to it. 
Now that that is expanded, it starts with gratitude, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. John Newton wrote, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what once I used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Bill Gaither took Newton's words and put them in a song. And it went like this. Oh, I'm not what I want to be. I'm not what I'm going to be. But thank God I'm not what I was. I'm not what I was. All three men were saying the same thing. Thank you, God, that although I was a servant of sin, I have learned enough doctrine, enough biblical principle to know better than to remain sin's slave. By the way, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29, the thing that will get you out of sin is knowledge of Scripture. To the Sadducees, he said, you do err, not knowing the Scripture, nor the power of God. The attitude of gratitude is followed by an attitude of obedience. This is the second part of verse 17. Ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered unto you. Salvation is the means by where God turns us into new creations, into new creatures, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. The creature, the new creation, has a new motivation to live righteously. The motivation is the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says, You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be it, the Spirit of God dwelt in you. Now, if any man hath not the Spirit of God, he's none of his. There is no such thing as a second blessing. Our charismatic brothers and sisters speak of the second blessing. They believe you get saved and then the Holy Spirit comes later. There is no such thing. At the moment of your salvation, the Holy Spirit enters into your life. When you believe, the Holy Spirit seals you. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 tells us to grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby we were sealed under the day of redemption. At the moment you accepted Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit entered into you He sealed you. He filled you. When you sin, you're draining the influence of the Spirit of God. When you stay out of sin, you are increasing His influence in your life. When you study the Word of God and learn the Word of God, you are empowering the Spirit to teach you things. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. But you you got to be available to it. You need to be involved in Bible study, in Bible reading, how, is it, how can he teach you the Word of God if you're not involved in the Word of God? Paul never says that the Romans were faithful to the form of teaching that they chose. He says they were faithful to the form of teaching that was delivered to them. So, we live in America. We live in, in an era and an age where I mean, you can choose churches based upon the type of music they have. Or you can choose a church based upon the type of preaching that they give. Now, I believe, and I'm sold on it, I believe in expository preaching. I believe the best way to learn God's Word is to take the Bible verse by verse and just go through and just learn every verse, what it means, and apply it. I believe that's the best method. But I know a lot of people who've learned a lot of the Word of God through topical preaching. There are some excellent preachers who preach on topic, and they teach the Word of God. The point is, is, you didn't get to choose what type of teaching you had, Romans. You took the kind of teaching that you had and you applied what you learned based upon what you were taught. The excuse for not teaching doctrine in our day is that doctrine divides. There was a whole movement back in the 1980s that we shouldn't be teaching doctrine because doctrine will divide us. Brother Tim and I were talking recently about a mutual friend, acquaintance, I've interviewed, spoken to three folks from his congregation, and one said they're Southern Baptist, and one said they were charismatic, and one said they were um, non-denominational. You can't, you can't be all three if you're teaching doctrine. It'll be very obvious what you are when doctrine is being taught. That the only reason doctrine divides is that, number one, what's taught is not being true. 
or number two, what taught is being taught is not true or is true and it's just not accepted. And what, why would true doctrine not be accepted? Because it's offensive. Concerning the teaching of doctrine, there are just a lot of methods. It, it reminds me of a fellow who came to me years ago. We were teaching in our church evangelism explosion, and he didn't like it. And he told me in front of the auditorium, sitting up here after church service, standing up here, he said, I don't like your method of soul winning. And I said, what method do you use? And he looked at me. Well, I don't have one. And I said, I like mine better. <laughs> do you know the best method is the one that's used? You like the four spiritual laws? Use it. Romans Road? Use it. Evangelism explosion? Use it. The whole point is... The one that's used is the one that's used, used by God. Now, let's get the next thing. Verse 18. We we'll call this rectitude, which is a real fancy word that I learned about two weeks ago. You know how you learn new words? It's called a thesaurus. And if you use a thesaurus, you can find really neat words like rectitude, which means moral correctness, which describes this verse pretty well. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Moral means right. So rectitude works. Here's the theory behind not sinning and the practical empowerment for living a life that is not sinning habitually, or for that matter, even practicing intermittent sin. At salvation, you were set free from the slavery you had lived in your entire life. Once you know Christ as Savior, you're sealed by the Spirit of God. You are sealed into the day of redemption. When salvation promise is realized, it's when you enter heaven. Now here's a new twist, Romans 6, 18. Earlier in Romans 6, 16, Paul hinted that we had a choice concerning what or who we serve. Now it appears that the choice has been made by God. It's the same issue presented in Calvinism. It's that theological system, same system, same issue in salvation as in sanctification. It's a twin set of facts and a twin set of truths. One fact, one truth is that God has a will for our lives and the other fact and truth is that you have a will for your life. Concerning salvation, God has a will for your life. He's not willing that any should perish. But you don't get saved until you agree with God's will, until your will matches his will. You are married. Most of us here today are married because the man chose to ask the woman to marry him, and she agreed. So when her will matched his will, they got married. Had he asked her to marry, and she said, I don't think so. It wouldn't matter what his will was anymore because she has the right to make that choice herself. She has the right of volition. Let's say that that man says, you don't have the right to say no to me. You're going to marry me like it or not. That's a hyperbole of what a hyper-Calvinist believes. Hyper-Calvinist believes God chose you. You're going to be saved. There's nothing you can do about it. You're going to be saved. I don't accept that. I, I believe that salvation takes place when God's will and your will meet. And you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You choose him. He already chose you. The, the doctrine is called volition. It's freedom of choice. But in that freedom of choice doctrine, that volition, there are two things. Number one, there's an opportunity to enjoy and there is a responsibility to endure the consequences of your choice. If you choose Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will spend eternity in heaven. That is the opportunity to enjoy. If you choose to reject Jesus Christ as Savior, you will spend eternity in the lake of fire 
And that is the responsibility to endure the consequence of your own choice. In salvation, God has chosen for us, all of us, all humanity to be saved. He is not willing that any should perish. But if a man's will does not match God's will, God will not force his will upon us. God has chosen to save us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but everlasting life. Since I've been your pastor, I had a man tell me that I didn't understand what the, world, the word world meant. And I assured him I did understand what it meant. It's pretty simple. In the concept of the scripture, the world means everybody in the world. I don't know what he was trying to prove, but it didn't matter. He's got the right to be wrong. I mean, when it's really simple like that, God has chosen to save us. Next issue is, will you choose for God to save you? In sanctification, God has chosen for every believer to be his servant, a servant of righteousness as opposed to a servant of sin. But if a believer's will does not match God's will, God will not force his will upon us. Even those who are believers, God will not force us to serve him. God has chosen for us to be servants of righteousness rather than servants of sin. What do you choose? He's not going to force you. In both salvation and sanctification, God has a will for us. And for his will to be realized, we must join him, matching our will to his will. By the way, in a marriage, that makes for a really sweet, really sweet relationship. When his will matches her will, you can get through all sorts of problems. He chooses her. She chooses him. It's the same thing in... It's the same thing in salvation. It's the same thing in, in sanctification. God chooses for me to serve him. I choose to serve him. It, it's a marvelous way to live. In salvation, the issue is, will you choose to be saved? In sanctification, the issue is, will you choose to live a sanctified, holy life? And the issue is in both. What is your will? Because if you don't choose to be saved, you'll not, you won't be saved. And if you don't choose to serve him, you won't serve him. And the only one to blame is the one who combs your hair every morning. Someone's going to come up afterwards and say, Preacher, my wife combs my hair. <laughs> You know what I mean, okay? <laughs> Best decision you'll ever make in life is I like God's will. I'm going to choose God's will. Therefore, I'm going to accept Christ as my Savior. Second best decision you'll ever make God wants me to serve Him rather than sin. I'm going to choose to do God's will in my life. Therefore, I'm going to serve righteousness. I'm going to serve Christ rather than sin. You will never regret either of those decisions. And now, Heavenly Father, I have no doubt that what I've spoken tonight is right on, especially concerning sanctification salvation, the stuff concerning my offense that was my own personal problem, and I confess it, and I admit to it, and I do pray for my president. I pray you take his heart and turn it. I pray you turn him into a, a, a man who loves the United States of America, one who loves you. But concerning salvation 
and concerning sanctification. I'm 100% certain that I am on target. And I am certain that the most important thing anyone ever does in their life is receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. And after that decision, the next most important decision they will ever make is to live a sanctified, holy life. Now, I made the decision to serve Jesus Christ, to accept Christ as my Savior years and years ago. But I have to make the decision to live a sanctified life every day. I pray that I will always make the right choice. And I pray that everyone listening to my voice will join me in that. Receiving Christ as Savior. And then serving the Savior by living a sanctified life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us? going to ask Robert to sing one verse then we're going to join him take up thy cross and follow me I heard my master say I gave my life to ransom thee Surrender your all today. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever I'll go with him, second verse. He drew me closer to his side. I sought his will to know. And in that will I now abide. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Robert, would you take that microphone and deliver it to Joe Mobley? While you're doing that, we've got a couple other folks to pray for we have not mentioned yet today or tonight. Thursday's a big day for a couple members of our church. Dick Stitzel's having knee surgery. Are they giving you a new one or just repairing the one you have? Going to get a new shiny one. You're going to be able to run now, right? Yeah, pray for Dick Stitzel knee surgery. Celeste Busby has some tests and procedures being done this Thursday as well, and she's asked us to pray for her. So, please pray for both Dick and Celeste. Brother Joe, dismiss us in prayer, please. Father God, we are so grateful to be in this church today, to hear this message, to know that your will is for us to have salvation in our lives, our eternity with you, Lord. We do thank you for each and everything you do for us every day. We thank you for this church, Lord. We're so grateful to have this facility, to have this pastor, to have this staff that works in this church. We see so many good things, and we're grateful that you provided that, Lord. As you lead us every day, uh, guide us in the right way, Lord. And we ask that you just protect us as we go through our life. Keep us in the word, studying and learning more each and every day. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.